Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Aaron Betsky uh, to the AA. Um, Aaron is no stranger uh, to the school. He's been a friend of the school for a long time. I think in the landscape of American critics, he's really among a very, very small group that I think has been extremely influential uh, in the recent past in bringing architectural discourse to a much wider audience and to be involved uh, not only with uh, his uh, projects as a curator, but also as a teacher, as a practicing architect, and of course uh, as uh, a writer. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, one of his recent books, Architecture Must Burn, that was very much visible uh, in, the, in, on the, in the bookstores in the last uh, couple of years. Um, he's also the uh, author of the recent uh, Landscrapers, uh, the uh, um, houses of Max Palevsky, called Three Houses, did you say? Three California Houses. And he's currently working on a book on uh, Dutch architecture called uh, False Flat, Why Dutch Design Matters. Uh, would you please welcome Aaron Betsky. Thank you. Um, I, I have to admit to being somewhat um, intimidated, to be quite frankly. Uh, I don't know if I've been a friend of the school for very long, but I certainly have been a admirer of the school for a, a very long time. Um, even back when I was a student um, and I would come back to Europe and I would often come through London. I grew up in the Netherlands, my parents still live there and I would stop through London and I would come straight from Heathrow uh, right here and I figured if I just walked into the bookstore in the bar I would know what was going on within seconds. So to be one of the people who was going on here is, is as I said a little bit intimidating. So when you're in that kind of situation, you should talk about what you know. Um, and what I know right now is Dutch architecture, and that's uh, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. Now, wanting to talk about Dutch architecture leaves me with another problem, which is that I understand that it's not very popular um, among certain architects, influential at the AA perhaps, in London. Um, who feel as if there was one master who innovated there and still lives there part-time and that everyone else is just a cheap imitation. I've gotten SMSs to that result, that uh, effect from one of those architects on several occasions. Well, it's just not true, goddammit. Um, there are a great deal of very interesting young Dutch architects and older architects but it's also not true because I think there is something going on in the Netherlands, has been something going on in the Netherlands for quite some time, that it's worth paying some serious attention to. I went back to the Netherlands, not just because they offered me a job, and not just because I had grown up there, but because I felt that Dutch architecture and design stood for something at this point of time in our culture, in our global economic and social situation. For the last few decades I've been living and working in the United States and I become very depressed by the bind in which architecture finds itself, creating a few exquisite little objects and maybe even a few grand monuments that sit rather isolated in a sprawling landscape filled with less than forgettable buildings and even more by the kind of structures that actually harm the lives of the people who live in them. In that sense it's both a depressing and an exhilarating place because the few moments of grand architecture are so great and the rest of the landscape, at least where human beings have touched it, is so bad. And I don't think that the problem is just the, the United States. I was just on the Mies van der Rohe Prize uh, jury this last weekend in Barcelona. 
And it was astonishing because my first reaction was, my goodness, here are 269 projects from all over Europe, and the quality is quite astonishing. Something I think you could not have said a few years ago, notably in places like Germany or Austria. But on the other hand, the quality of the work was good in a very polite manner, which is to say it was correct. It was thoroughly thought out, well constructed, and paid attention to all the things that, to which attention must be paid, light, structure, context, the scale of the human body. Most of these projects that had been deemed fit to be candidates for the award all were extremely well behaved. And then there were the weirdos, and they mainly came from the Netherlands. But they were weird not in a look at me, look at my freakish manners type of weirdness, but they were strange in very deliberate ways, considered in their strangeness. And it confirmed for me that the Dutch do have something to teach us, or at least to show us. Teaching is perhaps too grand a word, something that the Dutch would themselves never do. The Dutch, and I know this is a cliche, have made their own country. There is an old saying that God made the world, but the Dutch made the Netherlands. It's a country that would be underwater, 70% of it would be underwater, if it wasn't for an elaborate system of water control. My own house out on the edge of Rotterdam is six meters below sea level. And there's a little gray box in front of the house with a red light on it, and every week the high water count, or at least his deputies, come and control, look at the box. And we have been told if the red light ever goes on, we should immediately call them because it means that the Netherlands is in trouble. It's nice to have that kind of early warning function, I think. But this necessity of creating your own landscape means that in the Netherlands, the whole landscape is architecture, the whole landscape is artificial, the whole landscape is, excuse the gendering, man-made. The Dutch have created an artificial environment and their task is not so much to colonize more and more of what we think of as nature with built form, but rather to continually rearrange what already exists. And that means that the Dutch teach us, first of all, that all of our inhabited landscape is artificial. There's a few spots over there if people don't want to sit on the ground. There's chairs over there. Um, that there is an artificiality to our landscape that cannot be denied and that is the foundation, not some unalterable nature, but the very artifice of what we as human beings make. And in their work, they make us aware of that artificiality. In their reuse of that artificial nature, they also make us aware that we live, again a cliche, in a world of finite resources and the task is to reuse what we already have rather than making the always new. The Dutch are also a country that makes its money not by making things but by owning things. They own large chunks of London, for instance. Probably no one knows and they would prefer to keep it that way, but they do. And for them, the world exists potentially as a completely fungible and abstract set of data that can be translated into value, which means that they have few of the hang-ups about materiality, craft, realness that plagues and dignifies some other countries. It's all about data, it's all about statistics, and was so long before Mr. Kohlhaas discovered that. It's all about manipulating values in ever more complicated and profitable ways. 
The Netherlands is also a country where everything goes, but in going it must behave in a pleasant manner. It is a country where, yes, prostitution is more or less legal, and you can see the ladies sitting with bare breasts in front of the windows, but they have to sit behind their windows, carefully framed. Drugs are allowed, but only in certain places. There is a sense that the illicit can be woven through the fabric of the licit. And all these are things that I think gives force to Dutch architecture. Let me try and show you a few examples of what I'm talking about uh, to try and make my points. And I apologize. Not all of these slides are of fantastic quality. Uh, this is the other thing about the Dutch. They're not very, the, the, they're very good at buying and selling things, but they're not very good at selling themselves. Dutch architects have no sense that they should have nice images that can be sold to, uh, to the rest of the world. It's a, a real problem. Um, in any case, I think that the sense that design is important in the Netherlands uh, hits you when you first arrive at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. You are confronted with what is generally believed to be the most well-designed airport in the world, designed by Bentham and Cowell, at least the current iteration. Not perhaps the most efficient, not perhaps the most beautiful, but the most well-designed, the integration of facilities, signage, and spatial structures is so carefully calibrated that your progress through the airport can take place without almost any clear barriers, not in the limbo-like way that you float through some American airports, and certainly not in the chaotic way that you find your way sweating and cursing through Heathrow, but rather in the kind of carefully designed manner that is proper to the Dutch. The Dutch have had a long history of integrating graphic design, industrial design, and architecture. Again, they have had to because the space is so compressed. The complexity of movement is so great. The Netherlands, I think, is the only country that has a ministry that cares about all such things. It is the ministry of Vroom, or as I like to call it, Vroom Vroom. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite as agile as that name would imply, but it is the ministry of social housing, one, the environment, two, and spatial arrangement, which is to say there is one ministry who has as its task to understand, preserve, and protect the physical legacy of the Netherlands and to oversee its continual redistribution, rearrangement, and re-inhabitation so that everyone can have a place in it. And of course, what we then think of as the crown jewels of this effort are such, again, cliches perhaps, as the Schroeder, Schroeder House by Gerrit Rietveld in Utrecht, which is not just a three-dimensional Mondrian, but is also a building that takes apart the interior logic of the row house to the left of it and decomposes it into the complex rhythms of the canals, meadows, and irrigation ditches to the right of it, at least did so until they built a freeway right next to the house. Again, tight social uh, spatial planning. That complex puzzle is what makes the Schroeder House perhaps the emblem of Dutch architecture. It is the compaction of the many geometries and forces that interact on the Dutch landscape. And it comes together not in a series of tight little cubicles, but in an infinitely variable and flexible space. It is the place where I first learned about architecture. When I was about 10 years old, I was invited for tea with Mrs. Schroeder and bicycled there. And I still remember going there on a beautiful spring day 
and walking into this space and Mrs. Schroeder moving all of the walls around me so that either we were sitting in one big space or in two spaces, three spaces, four spaces. And then after she had done all of that, she said, my goodness, it's gotten warm, hasn't it? And she walked to the corner of this space, unlatched the carefully colored framed windows and opened them at the corner. And I still remember the feeling of all of the space of the room escaping out in to the landscape outside. And after that first rush, the landscape came back in, occupying this small interior space. It is that kind of complexity, controlled complexity, that I think lies at the core of Dutch architecture. Now, as I already said, the foundation of Dutch architecture, if that is the core, is this notion of the winning of the land from the sea and the making of an almost labyrinthine set of cities that are so dense and so complex that, as Henry James said about Amsterdam, they leave no list vistas that lead elsewhere. Everything returns in on itself. The Netherlands is, in many ways, an interior country. And this is another reason why I think we have something to learn from looking at the Netherlands. I have long argued that in architecture, we have grossly overestimated the importance of exteriors, facades, and autonomous buildings, which most people think of as irrelevant at best and oppressive at worst, things that stand in their way and eat up space in the city, whereas interiors are the place where we spend our time and which we care about in terms of their design, at least all of those of us who don't get completely excited by James Sterling-like complex plans or the complexity of facades that uh, some of the best British architects might produce. And the Netherlands, again because of the limits of its space, has had a long tradition of manipulating the interior, of bringing the vast outside world into the interior, of creating an art that is not about a window into another world, but that is a map or a mirror of the world all around us. Art as the rearrangement, the restatement, the mirroring and the mapping of the everyday reality which we inhabit, something I believe architects should and could learn from. And certainly in Dutch design, this is going on today. I believe there still is a, an exhibition at the Design Museum right now, of a selection of objects made by René Raammaker and Gijs Bakker of Droog Design. I would encourage you to take a look at that. I hope it contains some of the objects of people like Helion Girius, who highlight the necessity and the possible beauty of reusing this rich Dutch tradition and refocusing on the craft of the everyday, but both by elaborating it in rather perhaps absurd ways or by turning it into objects that have traditional forms but are made with completely new and today's vernacular materials. This reversal of form and type, this reuse of existing objects, is typical of Dutch industrial and graphic design. On the left, a table and chair by Ineke Hans that looks like a badly crafted wood set, but is in fact a plastic set, carefully crafted to look rather lumpen, but meant for outdoor use. I would argue, in fact, that if this was not the AA, I would be showing you a lot more industrial design because it is the industrial design, designers in the Netherlands who there, as in many other countries, are in the vanguard of developing some of the most interesting new possibilities inherent in the technologies that are now becoming so prevalent. But we must restrict ourselves to architecture. And there I must admit that I do have a bit of a problem in just talking about Dutch architecture as if it was 
a monolithic fact. After all, what is a national identity or a national way of doing things when even in a country like the Netherlands, over half the people working in the offices of architects like Rem Kolhaas, Neutlings Riedag, MVRDV are foreign. It's the general language used in those offices is English. And what are you to make of a Dutch architecture when in fact it is difficult to ascertain what any city or place really is? On the left, an image of the Dom Tower, which is the church in the middle of Utrecht, and I grew up about seven kilometers away from there, and when I was bicycling towards the city, I could always orient myself by this church, except, of course, that if I were to do that in this case, I would become thoroughly lost, because this is the Dom as it was rebuilt outside of Nagoya, Japan, as a theme park of Dutch architecture. On the right, my favorite camera store in Los Angeles, right down the block from where I lived when I first moved to Los Angeles and shared an apartment with Neil Denari. And while we were living there, the camera store went bust and it turned into an Indian restaurant, which was already a bit of a slip from the original facade. But it was a good Indian restaurant and we enjoyed it. But of course, this is not only not an Indian restaurant or a camera store, it is not even in Los Angeles. It is in Orlando, Florida, where they decided to rebuild a particular section of Los Angeles because they felt it was so attractive. The strength of Dutch architecture is again that it has surfed on and used that very malleability. As one critic put it, Dutch architecture creates a Photoshop reality. There is very little difference between the dreams of high modernity of creating a collage of always new materials floating over or right beyond the edge of what is possible and the physical artifacts that are actually constructed. And we are opening in a few weeks and this is a blatant plug for you to all come to Rotterdam on February 7th, a show called Reality Machines, highlighting not the guy on the left but images such as the one on the right by NL Architects which show us the artificiality of our daily environment in Dutch architecture, des design, and art. But having said that, I would still argue that there is a core to what can be seen in Dutch architecture, a core that first of all exists in the everyday, the daily, the fabric of the city. The Dutch have figured out, starting in the 18th century, 17th century, but strengthened a great deal by the passage of the social housing law of 1902, a way of making social housing that not only creates shelter for even those who cannot afford it, but that also out of the aggregate of such shelters creates a city, creates an environment that not only is coherent, but has focal points, monumental moments, and places where the fabric comes down, meets the body, responds to the hand, the eye, the foot. This is an architecture of particularity and grand purpose melded together by the simple need for creating mass housing. How different that kind of architecture is of the sprawling, than the sprawling boxes of absence in which so many inhabitants of the American and also English and French and German suburbs are imprisoned. How different the solidarity, the complexity, the beauty of such structures from the disastrous rape of the landscape that is now taking place all over the world. How different the ability to create a monument to create a place of gathering in the city from the empty parking lots and thin facades of shopping malls. How different the belief that one can in fact build a modern society, a belief that despite all public 
uh, political upheaval still remains evident in the Netherlands from the complete defeatism of American architecture, how different the streamlined dreams of Yeye Pei out from the absent stucco walls of Orange County behind which people hide in security systems in the glare of television fed by electronics and sewage systems so that they can close themselves off from an outside world they see as completely inimical. How different even from the traditions of European modernism, instead of the repetitive blocks draped across the landscape according to some abstract system, the ability to use those same forms to create public spaces of great generosity, public spaces that unfortunately are now being threatened by the same global tide of rationalization that is causing cooperative housing developments to be replaced by private developers working according to, believe it or not, British models that tell them that such public spaces for housing need to be completely privatized and turned into isolated little gardens. Much of the ability to create such an architecture is political and has to do with the strengths of labor movement in the Netherlands that tied into the great dreams of creating a city out of housing. But it also is tied to technology. And it is in that light that I think one must understand statements such as Rem Kohlhaas's no money, no details. It is not a question of just not doing anything. It's a question of rationalizing building practices to the point where they become systematic, but systematic in a way that can be easily manipulated, that can be deformed and reformed by young architects. It's one of the reasons why young architects get jobs in the Netherlands. Again, how different from the building technology in the United States that eats up acre after acre of forest and creates horribly thin and inefficient walls. Structural expressionism is an important undercurrent in all Dutch architecture. It is a way of showing how things are made, but also a way of connecting the small scale where the hand touches the building and where one person inhabits the city to the larger social whole. It goes all the way back, not only to the 17th century, but to Berlache, who said that he preferred using brick because the red brick that together made the wall was like the member of the labor movement that together made the great red wall that was going to create the society of the future. And Berlach, in fact, made that city in Amsterdam, and his followers continued his lessons all over the Netherlands, well, in Los Angeles, and now in London, sprawl eats up acre after acre of landscape, covering everything between here and Timbuktu with a concatenation of human dwellings, lost of all meaning and forgotten of all possibility of social context. The challenge for the Dutch is, however, very real and continues to be housing. In 1985, the Dutch realized that within the next 20 years they would have to build over a million new dwellings, not only because of increased birth rates and immigration into the country, but also because of the process of what's called thinning, by which people both want more space and have smaller family units. And much of the most interesting innovation and experimentation in Dutch architecture has therefore taken place in the realm of housing to counter the nightmare vision of Adrian Geuze in this exhibition at the NIE where he laid out what those million monopoly houses would look like. And in order to preserve the achievements of the neighborhoods built after the Second World War. It is even at its most conservative a rather remarkable architectural scene. Architects such as Case Christiansa building here in Rotterdam are capable of creating large-scale urban projects that mix a variety of different open spaces from narrow streets to wide lawns and large boulevards with 
filled in with houses that range from the super expensive yuppie loft to the tightly compacted bits of social housing. Even more impressive to me is the kind of work that he does together with the planner Riek Bakker in new towns such as Leitze Rhein outside of Utrecht where the very compacted rows of Dutch social housing are displayed and splayed throughout the fingers of the existing landscape, leaving a pattern of meadows and irrigation ditches that has the same dimensions as the streets and the neighborhoods made in between them, so that the existing landscape is not obliterated but rather transformed in a visible manner by its occupation in these new towns that at some point will have 100,000 inhabitants. More and more young Dutch architects, such as BAR here on your left, are able to create social housing using standardized technology for reasonable prices that are affordable for most Dutch people that respond to the existing landscape and that manipulate new technologies, bring them into contact with the tradition of existing Dutch architecture. At their best, some of these uh, architects, such as Carla Weber, are even proposing that buildings can become things that one can customize oneself, social housing for which one, well, this is actually, sorry, not quite social housing, it's a little bit above that but housing that one can buy, add on to, take apart, and recombine so that it becomes more specific to one's life exactly because it still uses that absolutely standardized building technology. The best example of this, I think, is the project that won the NAI prize for the best building designed by an architect under 40 in the last two years. Um, and by the way, we had 160 submissions, which is quite remarkable in a country that size. This is Hagen Eiland by MVRDV outside of The Hague, where they did something very simple. They took the row house, which has its standard building technology, and they just took it apart. They would leave four houses on the road, then push one back, bring three back to the road, push two back, and so forth. The result, however, was remarkable. The whole block is filled in with a series of dwelling units, creating a network of paths between them in which your front yard is your neighbor's backyard and little kids are always playing in between them. They have managed to do something that few other architects anywhere have achieved, namely, they have created a standardized urban village. In order to keep its cost low, this is social housing, and in order to create recognizable bits within it, they then clad each of these blocks in one material so that little kids, as I've experienced, can point and say, I live in the blue house, or I live in the red house. No money, no details. It is, as Jacob van Rijs puts it, a gutterless architecture in which all technology is removed by that cladding in one material. At the level of detail, it is again making use of the most standardized building components, including the kinds of sheds that one buys at big Home Depot-like stores. And in doing so, it creates the kind of domestic scale and domestic sphere that one expects from the Dutch tradition and which allows this kind of community to exist even in the seeming middle of nowhere. The firm BAR is proposing another such experiment in which they are taking apart the long rows of housing, manipulating them into slightly larger structures, breaking open the block, and then trying to combine the recognizability of the Dutch house with its steeply gabled roof and brick facade with the openness that Dutch desire of their houses, the Miesian tradition. I have to tell a, a, a quick little anecdote. There was a lot of uproar among architects last year when one of the largest developers of housing did a study of what people actually wanted in their houses. 
And the headline in the paper, and again, only in the Netherlands, was this front page above the fold news on the largest paper in the Netherlands. Headline was, Dutch want traditional homes. And all the architects said, oh my God, it's all over. Well, when you read the data, it was very interesting because it turned out that first of all, they wanted traditional homes by 23%, which was only one per two percentage points more than, quote, modern homes, unquote, in which the model was the Rietveld Schroeder house. And everything else was divided almost equally. I also think they skewered it because their idea of, quote, experimental houses was a firehouse converted into a dwelling, which I think is a little bit further than most architects would go when they make experimental architecture. But what's even more remarkable is that that largest category of traditional houses by one percentage point was modernist villas from the 1930s, the kind of thing that in the United States and I suspect in England would still be seen as rather radical. In any case, the Dutch want the recognizable image along with the freedom and openness of modernity so BAR is prepared to give it to them by cladding the houses completely with brick in great berlach of fashion and then opening them up into the kind of modernist loft that the Dutch say they prefer. That kind of absolutely no-nonsense collage it together if you need more space just add it on. Don't worry about whether it follows gravity or any classical or modernist order. Just make it so it works is, of course, one of the most exciting hallmarks of the Dutch architecture and the aspect that leads to the most gee whiz out there kind of exuberance as one sees in the famous Vozoko housing on the left by MVRDV and in the house that Bjorn Mossebuch designed for himself in Borneo, Borneo Sporenbuch in Amsterdam. Need more space? Just add it on. Space is limited, manipulate it, use it. Build with the land, not on top of it, as Lukas Verve proposed in his autarkic house, a house that is to be completely self-sustaining. Don't have any new space? Go to the back of an existing industrial terrain and build the little orange box for the graphic design firm Tonic, a building that shows its combination of living and working merely in the manipulation of the windows in an otherwise rather staid facade. Even further on the horizon is a dream that houses could be assembled by different systems. And I apologize for this, is, for this terrible slide. This is my fault, not theirs. I shot it out of focus uh, and didn't notice it until yesterday. Um, uh, where the, uh, um, sorry, now I've lost what I was going to say. Um, the idea is that instead of using the standard Dutch concrete construction system, you use a Swedish wood panel system that can be assembled to create a series of beautiful light-filled spaces that can then be parasitically posed on any existing structure. Parasite, one of the other projects nominated for the NEI prize, was built on top of an old uh, industrial building in the harbor of Rotterdam and was seen as a prototype for the kinds of highly specific dwellings that could easily be built by using existing plumbing and this Swedish system and then reassembled where they'd be needed in the future. No nonsense, completely logical, extrapolating from systems, but then you paint it green and make it slightly taller so that the absurdity as well as the novelty of the object becomes obvious. The young Rotterdam firm uh, of uh, urban affairs is more interested in the manipulation of the vernacular. Uh, on the left, a house entitled, entitled, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, in which they used another found leftover space to create a series of three interlocking lofts. And because both budget and space were so limited, none of the walls quite line up in the perfect way and none of the materials have the grandeur that one would expect for these little yuppie living environments. Instead, everything folds in, over, and around each other using the most off-the-shelf materials they could find. On the right, the loft for a hairdresser in the city of Eindhoven who wanted a place where he could bathe in the middle of his loft in, this high, in a high-rise building 
but he also happened to need a kitchen, so in good Dutch manner, they just combined the bathroom and the kitchen, creating a bathtub that when he has lots of guests, he actually apparently really does use to do the dishes uh, when they no longer fit inside the dishwasher. One can't, of course, do it only by making these kind of small and delicate or intricate structures. The Dutch are also finding that the scale is increasing. But even as they increase the scale of their housing developments, they manage to somehow twist away from the ordinary, setting their blocks, dancing around the harbor of Amsterdam on the left, or in this project by Javier de Geiter in Breda, around a former armor bar barracks that was replanned by OMA. These are structures that engage the city that are guided not by the restrictions imposed by city zoning officials fighting with the needs of developers to have as much rentable space as possible and architects to express themselves, but that rather come out of a negotiation of all those parties leading in an almost inevitable form to their complex shapes. The Dutch are politically famous for something called the polder model, something now somewhat maligned, but still quite effective. The Polder model very simply says that any problem must be solved in such a manner that everyone around the table is happy. This takes a great deal of time and can be very tiring, but it means that no one is allowed to walk away from the table having felt that they've lost the negotiations. So it is with the architecture, and so it leads to some of the strangest manipulations a built form that are, have yet been seen. Some of them, in fact, so strange that, as in the project, the Y building for the uh, River A in Amsterdam, they cannot be built yet uh, using current construction technologies. The best Dutch architects, of course, see their work as a way of delving into the complexities and the constrictions of the situation, even when they are building villas for rich people in huge sites. Their architecture is one of mapping and mirroring the everyday, even in such luxurious situations. Even Ben van Berkel and Caroline Bos did so when they designed their 24-7 uh, uh, amoeba-like villa in the Troy on the left creating a series of interlocking spaces, no different than the kind of lab spaces they designed for the NMR Magnetic Resonance Lab in Utrecht on the right. Nothing goes anywhere else, nothing escapes, everything folds back on itself. Nothing is allowed to be monumental, it is only the logic of functions that come always back to themselves that creates the density that is itself monumental. Even when a building such as the Falkhof Museum by UN Studio stands on itself at the edge of a market square, its logic is one of self-denial as it disappears into the coolness of the gray-blue sky and into a detailing that denies its physicality. Its grand staircase is part of the structural system and initiates a series of labyrinth-like paths that lead to the collection rather than leading you up to the victory of some atras or some other grand monumental moment. And of course, Rem Kohlhaas is the one who turned many of these techniques into canonical buildings, such as the Kunsthal in Rotterdam, perhaps his greatest work. A building that has all of the hallmarks of a monumental cultural edifice, but then denies them by opening up its great maw, displacing its columns and its entry, creating a void down its middle, destabilizing its piano nobile, weaving its galleries into each other, stating its structure, denying it, and then restating it, letting you become lost among the intricacies of something that is no more than a rearrangement of the cheapest materials possible, a logical extrapolation of the program, and an intensification and densification of the existing surroundings. 
So it is even in the abstract and sometimes even brutal forms of Viel Aretz working in the more southern mode of Dutch architecture tending towards the grandeur that, part, that one finds in places like Belgium, well maybe Brussels rather than all of Belgium, but certainly in France, bringing that sense of clarity and complexity into an altogether grander form. By now, one is even beginning to see a kind of architecture that breaks from the manipulation of boxes for which the Dutch have begin, become so well known. I show you here the work of René van Zuyck, his little pavilion called the Verbeelding, the Imagination, an art pavilion in a polder landscape in which he took the trusses that are used to make industrial-like agricultural sheds, pulled them apart, cantilevered them, and reassembled them to create a series of interlocking spaces that together form a small art gallery. And I think if you look carefully, you can see Robert I am the AM and the PM2 Stern walking towards that structure there. Um, it has become more and more for young Dutch architects about the manipulation of one's expectations and their reversals. Here, a aluminum expo in which the whole structure is held aloft by a forest of aluminum legs. The long, thin legs of architecture, called Himmelblau, once dreamed of, here turned into a rather absurd but also very rational set of very cheap elements that exhibit exactly what this pavilion is supposed to show you. And of course, the masters of this kind of complex, sometimes banal, verging on the monumental, but always coming back to its Dutch roots, architecture, Neutlingsriedeck, making fire stations here that, as Willem Jan Neutlings put it, always verge, are always on the verge, I'm doing a quick translation in my head right now, verge on the border between utter cliched banality and something that I guess you would call art. An architecture that refuses, on the one hand, to just reestablish norms, but on the other hand, refuses to be just a monument. An architecture that always veers off almost to bad taste, or as Nerdlings put it, into laziness. An architecture that is difficult to photograph and difficult to show. You can perhaps only see the careful manipulation of windows that continually reverses scale. Note the way in which brick is plastered around and concrete is used. Try to figure out whether what the scale is of these strange structures or what their purpose might be if it wasn't for the fire truck. Always it is an architecture that comes back on itself. In their latest structure, a project for the library of the uh, National Media Library of the Netherlands currently under construction, the whole building is an iceberg showing one of the other tendencies that is becoming stronger and stronger in the Netherlands, not just for the reuse of existing land, but of tunneling into the ground. They're starting by putting a large chunk of the TGV as it comes up in the Netherlands underground. Four other major highways in the Netherlands are currently being put underground, and more and more structures are being treated in the same way. The Dutch are the only country in Europe that is as strong as Asian countries such as Japan in developing underground spaces. And lifting up out of this underground space is this collage of media images that seem to deny the building even as it states its rather bulky and monumental presence. Perhaps my favorite of these kind of this but that, neither that nor anything else, referring back but also pointing forward type of buildings is this little office building at the end of the runway in Maastricht at the Maastricht Airport by Max One Architects, a building that consciously recalls museum prototypes, but also the kind of banal structures built in the 1960s and still found on the way to the airport. A building that's reversal of one's expectation about gravity and good, polite form continually astonishes one just at the point when one is accepting its elegant and reduced modernist lines. And then, of course, 
there is this famous structure by NL Architects, the transformer station in Leitzerein, the rubber building, a building completely filled in rubber that becomes an enigmatic object in the Dutch landscape, much in the tradition of Herzog and de Meuron, but that then also becomes part of everyday life by turning itself into a climbing wall and even into a basketball uh, backboard. Some of the best of these structures, in fact, begin to run away, to run away from themselves as pieces of permanent and recognizable architecture. They turn into such things as this temporary bicycle shed outside of the central station in Amsterdam by uh, VMX, VMX Architects, a building that is no more and no less than an unfolding of the sidewalk into a continual loop along which 5,000 bicycles a day can park, a structure with no facade, no beginning, no end, and only a temporary lifespan. DP6 architects working in uh, the Floriada Expo, Garden Expo, created this temporary structure assembled out of garden shed materials shot through with plants and turned into not much more than the scaffolding of everyday life where you could pee and wash your hands among literal scaffolding and where plants could take over in between the sheets of plastic and the rough timbers that had assembled this building only for a spring and a summer. That kind of denial of building, even as one is asserting its constructional technology, is becoming more and more popular among young architects, whether it is used to create both a larger scale and a basketball court for a small school on the left, or whether it is used as an art project in the middle of a maximum security prison by Jo Schote here on the right, in which the structure is meant to remind the prisoners of their imprisonment, but in a way that is so open that it denies the particularities of the kind of restrictions in which they, mu they must live. Strangely enough, I think that this structure belongs in that kind of a reductive architecture, an architecture that is the result of an attempt to make forms that cannot be explained by their constructional principles, by their desire to withstand gravity or create shelter, but rather are the logical result of the manipulation of information and data to create the most minimal form. This, an asylum seeker center uh, out on the very eastern part of the country, in which the actual use of light and the length of the corridors is the strict translation of all of the codes and all of the security regulations turned into an architecture that admits of no additions and no frou-frou. The monument, if you will, of all such efforts is, of course, the V. Piero Villa by MVRDV uh, in existence now for about eight years. The headquarters of a small broadcasting company it is a building without beginning or end that emerges out of its uh, parking lot. You walk directly from your car into the lobby and becomes a series of interlocking terraces that lead all the way up from the neon, the fluorescent lit interior of the parking lot to the garden up above. There are no floors. There are no separate areas in which one works. There is only a series of spaces, raw, concrete, the direct translation of program, no money, no details, no beginning, no end, a labyrinth that turns back on itself, but then at the top, a new nature, a refound nature, a place that replaces the land that the building itself had taken up, a place into which one emerges into an almost utopia on top of this small place of work. And that sense of new nature has, of course, become a theme in the work of MVRDV, a theme that they used as the main element of their Hanover Fair, creating a stacked Dutch landscape, proving that the Dutch know how to use the land in many different ways, proposing that, in fact, that artificiality should be exhibited and turned into the point of architecture. 
a point that they extrapolated in their theoretical research, such as MetaCity, Datatown, and some of the work that they are doing now. An architecture that they propose that is the collection of data, that is the examination of social and economic structures, not in order to form the foundation for building, but rather as the basic ingredients of building itself. The dance of zeros of ones, the manipulation of direct social and economic flows into something that has the reality of a landscape, that is an artificial world in which one can live, in which the final shelter becomes the land itself, in which artificiality now has become total and complete. It is a theme that is being picked up by young architects all over the Netherlands, proposed as housing projects that snake their way through Amsterdam, or that can turn into parking lots with submerged houses on the outskirts of that same city. It is also a proposition that ties into a long-standing and fundamental theme in Dutch architecture, that one must build with the land, and that preferably one should even build under the land, that one must see architecture as a manipulation of the land as exists, as in this small office extension by Meccano, that in fact one should not be able to tell apart building and land, that one can see the making of a building as no more and no less than the lifting up of the landscape, its restatement, its reinterpretation, its folding back in on itself, as in the library made by Meccano on the left, or the landscape by uh, West 8 on the right. Some of the architects are even proposing that form should be eschewed altogether, that the way one creates livable environments is not by creating modern structures, but by letting nature back in, by opening the city back up to nature, by indeed seeing the whole country as a hybrid landscape in which physical and natural structures together create an environment conditioned by technology and dedicated to reuse in which every inch of space is used but also celebrated. It is something that the Dutch are peculiarly good at because they make land rather than legally dividing it, because they are able to manipulate land, creating a dense interlocking set of functional overlaps and vistas that always come back on themselves rather than creating the strict barriers between mine and yours, public and private, city and country a hybrid landscape, an answer perhaps to the sprawling anemone that uh, is now threatening so much of our landscape, an intensification, a densification, and a reuse of infrastructure as a way of creating more possibilities for human use, for creating more life in a dense neighborhood. A thinking about architecture as an unfolding of what exists in the land, a thinking of architecture as the basic structure that itself becomes the space that we use, whether in public or in private, a thinking of architecture as a series of delicate gestures, where necessary and only there, an architecture that might, in fact, at some point become so thin that it is even invisible. It is, for me, no accident that perhaps the greatest monument in the city where I live and work, Rotterdam, is not some tall structure, not some erotic gherkin, not some great palace, but is rather a bridge that unfolds itself out of the street, out of the sidewalks, out of the fabric of the city, and turns into this great cantilever gesture, taller than anything around it, and by now, the iconic sign by which one can recognize the city of Rotterdam. That is, in the end, why I believe Dutch architecture is important, because it shows us how we might be at home in, figure out where we are, and make sense out of a landscape 
that is becoming increasingly difficult to know. Where are we when we are everywhere? Where are we in the empire of the sign? What is the role of architecture when what is needed is only those signs that tell us where to go or what to buy? The great dream that we were moving towards the creation of some great monument, some great shining glass utopian environment on top of a hill, and that all architecture should be the promise of the erection of such an utopia, has been replaced by the reality that utopia can only be found in advertising or science fiction. Instead of us dreaming of living in utopia, we dream of living in a gated community where we are safe and sound, fed by technology, and without any contact with the real world around us. Where are we at in an environment in the which the ability of architecture to physically build memory, both our own and our societies, as Aldo Rossi had claimed, has been replaced by the ability of architecture to turn anywhere into any place, to theme reality into whatever you want it to be. Want to be in Venice? Just go to Las Vegas. In the future, just put on the goggles, drop the pill, or call the architect who projects it for you in an instant. What do we do in an environment in which our monuments, our focal points, the ways by which we know our society are all fake castles, whether they are grand museums or shopping malls, and in which the rest of our landscape is nowhere and no place at all. I believe that the best architects, whether in the Netherlands or wherever they are in the world, are gathering together exactly the anonymity and the dross of our landscape into a series of structures that unfold themselves out of the regular, slowly but with assurance, to create buildings and spaces that remind us of where we are and thereby perhaps who we are, that dare to create grand space that is public, that dare to bring back nature however defined it might be, an architecture that is perhaps no more than marking, drawing, mapping, stating, and mirroring the land, that is a way of, first of all, helping us figure out where we might be and what we might do with that particular land. It might be something as silly as a band shell. It might also be a piece of sculpture. But it is the statement of a beginning point, a place to start, the first statement of architecture, the stone one finds in the middle of the forest. It is the statement of an architecture that regularizes, compacts, abstracts, reinterprets, restates nature all around us. Not nature as some romantic fact, but nature as that, whether it is man-made or woman-made or natural, that helps us figure out where we are, that gives us clues, that gives us something that we can hold on to. To do so, it might have to become almost invisible. It might have to be no more than scaffolding, no more than the thing on which things grow, no more than the beginning point of another architecture. It might, in fact, have to be no more than a projection, a collection of data that is, in fact, only theoretical, that is the proposal, not utopian, ooh, but upside down, the proposal for an architecture that is monumental in its artificiality, that revels in its sheer artificiality. It might be an architecture that begins to create great shapes, but also the vectors of movement through an increasingly sprawling environment. It might be a magic mountain, a magic mountain now as a series of computer-manipulated glass forms that recover the uh, mall of what used to be a hillside 
on the southern coast of Spain. It could even be a park that you walk up until you are 30 stories above the ground on top of a building. It could be the frozen, not music, but water that turns into a small exhibition pavilion that snakes its way out of the water in the Netherlands. It could be no more than the statement of the layering of technology that we need in order to survive in the harsh desert of Palm Springs in this project by Neil Denari, or it could be just peeking up out of the hills of Wales on your right. It could be, above all else, something that starts, as architecture once did, in a cave. 20 years, 15 years ago, Morphosis designed this small wall next to a large hospital in Los Angeles. Nothing more than the statement of a few lines and a fragment of a wall, the first building blocks of an architecture. Then you descend through it into a light-filled space, a space where you're treated for cancer, a space where you are buried underground, plugged into technology, flushed full of chemicals with poison, so that you can, if all goes well, be reborn back up at the level where the tree lives, back up at the level of the street. A place where you can be reborn. A romantic place, a luxurious place. A place where architecture can still dream of having a significance, not by making grand objects that state themselves in the urban landscape and become nothing but fuss and bother, not by creating ever wilder forms, not by creating ever more complicated houses for ever richer people, but rather by beginning to investigate at the level of the interior, at the level of the land, at the level of shelter, how one might be able to make an architecture that matters. That, for me, is what is necessary in architecture, manipulating the land, restating it, reimagining it, so that we might, at some point, be able to escape out of it. Robert Venturi, 40 years ago, said that the nearness to chaos, but its avoidance, gives force. The nearness to the chaos that Charles Jenks has told us underlies all human and natural structures, but also the chaos that surrounds us every day in which we are lost, but its avoidance by architecture. Its avoidance by avoiding the spaces of avoidance, the limbo spaces, the spaces of nowhere in which we endlessly wait like a population of Godots for a utopia that never comes. Instead of those kinds of limbo spaces, we need slow space, not stop space, not monumental space, not frozen space, not grand space, not correct space, not the space of classicism or modernism, not fast space, not the space in which we are lost, not the space of the latest technologies of the latest computer games, not space in which we can forget where we are, but slow space, the space of slow motion, the space where we can begin to figure out how we have made this world ourselves and how we might be able to remake it. That is something in which I believe the Dutch experiment has a place, and that is something that I hope all of us as architects will be able to achieve. Thank you. I think there's a phenomenal amount of uh, provocation. So I hope that there'll be uh, lots and lots of uh, questions. I, I myself want to uh, maybe ask you a very simple question, nothing, <laughs> nothing very provocative. Uh, at the beginning, you uh, set up the duality between uh, what you had, uh, your experiences in the States or your reading of, of the architecture in the United States. Mm -hmm versus all the kind of glories and positive things about Holland, what Holland had that the US didn't have. 
And um, just in terms of um, being a chief curator in San Francisco versus being a, in charge of an architecture museum in the Netherlands, how has that side of your life changed, just in terms of how you select things, how what's open to you, what is possible? Because I think that the lecture was focusing on the architecture in a way, and I'm, I'm sort of curious, moving from the States back to Holland, what has it enabled you that you couldn't do? What could you do in the States that you can't do in Holland? So is that, and, and that shouldn't be another lecture. By the way, I was unbelievably impressed with the way this man talks. You know, I, if I could write like that after days, it would be, I thought it was like one of these uh, things they have for the newsreaders that maybe we can't see it, but you were reading from somewhere? Well, how did you do that? No, anyway, that's it. It's, like, <laughs> it's, taken me, it's taken me a year and a half. Now I'm learning how to do it in Dutch, which has taken me a long time. But um, uh, what does it talk about? Well, of course, of course, everything I said, you should, you should understand that I'm a paid employee of the Dutch government. So uh, uh, this was all no more than propaganda. Um, of what have I learned? I mean, other, other than, than lots of things about human resource management and stuff like that. Um, the, the, on, on a personal level, it's, well, it's been a very strange time in the Netherlands. I don't know if any of you follow Dutch politics, but there was this very strange uh, year that's almost, uh, it's now already being called the lost year of Dutch politics because um, uh, this phenomenon erupted uh, about this time last year, which was a radically s and queer politician um, who got on national television and in the, talked about rimming and things like that and invited cute boys to call them after the program um, who um, had mainly what were seen as about the right-wing views and a very charismatic way of presenting himself, a guy called Pim Fortin, who went from nowhere to being shot and after he was being shot, having the third largest or the second largest party in the country, um, and and his party still governs Rotterdam, where I live, extraordinary phenomenon. And one of the things that it uh, that it uh, made me realize that is that um, there is a sense in which the uh, achievements of the Dutch state are doubted continually by its own by its own citizens, and they're doubted as soon as they become, if you will, as bureaucratic and as rational as they are anywhere else in the world. And what Pim Fortin did was he continually asked for a kind of Dutchness, and that took a rather negative tone in his um, wanting to keep foreigners out, all that kind of stuff. Um, though it, I, I have to, I mean, he was a really weird, in some ways, evil guy, but he was not a racist. Unfortunately, most of his followers were and are. Um, but it was, for him, it was an issue of trying to figure out what made the Netherlands Dutch. And believing that there was actually something there that should be, however artificial it was, should be preserved and brought back. And that actually is what made me wonder about what Dutchness is. Um, now, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but it's... Maybe Charles. You know, there was a... Uh, there was a meeting Charles, here. Just wait for a microphone. Sorry. Or two fingers. You got it, or? Okay, well, maybe you ask. Yeah, yeah, sure. There, there was a meeting. Yeah, if you speak to it, they'll turn it's, up. It? Yeah. There was a meeting here in uh, maybe eight, eight years ago um, with uh, Caroline Boss and, and Ole Bauman and Bauman and others. Not that long ago. Sorry? Not that long ago. Oh, five years ago? Yeah. Okay. Four. Is there a Dutchness in Dutch architecture, mm, mm. right? Here, right, I mean. Right. And, um, and it was presented in a way with a kind of oblique uh, irony, so you couldn't really tell if, if uh, Bauman was saying there isn't or was there or is it a remnant in archite Dutch architecture? Or, you know, what is, uh, what is this thing in an international age where, mm. as you said, people all, the Dutch are speaking English and they're acting incredibly pragmatic but there is something, obviously, at the same time, very identifiable. What struck me in, in, your, in your presentation of it is, first of all, knowing you, and knowing you also lived in Los Angeles, is that it's a curious way, even though you were, you were sticking Los Angeles and kicking it, 
um, th there is the overlap of the informal. Mm. And, and, you know, I mean, if one just looks at the really good uh, LA architects and the architects that you liked here and showed, there's actually quite an interesting similarity yeah. oh, in, in terms of that informal. So that immediately uh, questions whether it's a Dutchness or an LA-ness, although Remember, we called, we talked about the L.A. school as, as uh, yeah. Gary oh, Schuler. Gary Schuler. No, it wasn't me. I <laughs> just picked it up, like you. Uh, I mean, you worked for Gary, anyway. Uh, but, but there is a Gary Schuler from one point of view, and, and there is obviously a Dutchness. Now, the pragmatic thing has such a funny double bind, doesn't it? Because there, there are Dutch professors in Rotterdam, I think, who are saying that they're going to pave over Holland you know, with one story of uh, tulips, a second story of pigs, a third story of, of uh, housing and so forth. I mean, th these are real schemes taking off from Murfter. And these are really kind of... Well, they're, they're semi-real. It's actually, it's interesting. One of the reasons supposedly why uh, Pim Fortin was shot was because he had publicly endorsed the pig city scheme. And the, no, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, and the, the guy who shot him was a rabid environmentalist. And this was one of the things that he cited as an example of for town's weirdness. Vinnie Moss had police protection for several months after that. It's okay. quite something. So my question is really, is this question of your critical, uh, I mean, ad admitting that you're here to, as the adjunct of the Department of uh, Promotion of Holland, can you <laughs> say something of what's wrong with it? Now, to show us the dark side or talk about a little bit about the dark side of this, because if you're putting it against well, LA, I mean, sure, I'm sure you have another side. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of dark, dark sides, which I was starting to indicate. But I, I think actually your first point is 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 quite interesting. Um, what what I am calling Dutchness is actually, and that's why I tried to end it the way I did, has more to do with what I think are um, attitudes towards architecture that come out of an interest in the interior, that come out of certain ways of using building technology, that come out of an interest in the land, understood not as nature but as an artifice, um, an interest in uh, the use of data, um, pragmatism understood in the way that John Dewey um, used it, which is as a kind of form of bringing experience together through uh, using one's experience in experimental manner, experimental architecture. Um, so these are the kind of qualities that I see in Dutch architecture. And yes, you're right, they are also very prominent in some of the better uh, LA architecture as well as some of the better British architecture and French architecture and as such. Um, so the Netherlands is only a kind of a, a um, uh, uh, I hope a kind of recognizable melody uh, to, to bring the, the, the message home with. Um, in terms of the dark side, of course there, there are lots and lots of dark sides. The most obvious ones is that the Dutch have no fucking, sorry, no idea um, how to deal with um, office buildings uh, and um, the kind of buildings that you see on the sides of, of freeways. At least they didn't. They're beginning very quickly to catch on, some of them at least. Uh, but the Dutch city is never designed to have office buildings in it and most of them look horrible and Dutch architects have no idea what they're doing when they try to design office buildings. Um, so that's a very dark side. Um, the other, the, 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 but the real, the kind of deep dark side is, of course, that the only reason that this can exist is that as soon as there's a dark side, the Dutch export it. They get rid of it. Uh, those pigs, for instance, are, it's, it's uh, a response to the fact that the Dutch are right now the largest per capita pig keepers of all of Europe. And uh, a little while ago, they discovered that pig keeping, intensive pig keeping is really messy and really bad for the environment as well as for the pigs. Um, and their response has been not to build Pig City, but to export them to Poland. Uh, let, them, let them foul up the rivers there and let the pigs be treated in inhumane ways there uh, and reuse the land of the Netherlands for um, country homes um, and just live off of the investment, and this is literally what they're doing, of big pig farms in Poland. So. The, the Dutch are quite ruthless in many ways, and the whole society drives on the kind of manipulation of landscapes in a rather less than fortunate way in a lot of other places. Question there, Irene? Um, 
Indeed. Are you, In about are you 1995, 1997, um, at the time the Vinex program was getting underway, the impression outside the Netherlands was that uh, the Netherlands was a kind of architectural paradise <laughs> and that there was going to be architecture with a capital A for all. And uh, I do, I remember it personally as a moment which was extremely exciting. Since then, and, or rather from your presentation, one would believe that actually rather little has changed uh, in those eight years. But um, I nevertheless can think of some signs. For instance, a column written by Kiss Christiansen in Arceus about five years ago in which he was ranting, to my amazement, precisely against some of the younger architects which you are talking about. I can also think about Adrian Heuser speaking about uh, perhaps two or three years ago at the IBA and say as a warning to the audience that the last thing which uh, architects in this country should do should, uh, is actually to imitate uh, the Vinex uh, format. Um, and referring to the blandness of uh, the new suburbs in Holland and so on. And indeed, the thing which has struck me is a sense of deep skepticism amongst the better architects in Holland about the Vinex operations. Now, the other point I would like to make is that, um, say, the shortlist, for instance, of the NAI, which I must say are good architects, you know, Parasite and MVRDV and VMX, um, I think are on a quite different agenda. I don't think that they are, like Case Christian say, like Neutlings with Ike, arguing for um, an architecture for all. In fact, there is a very clear sense, to me at least, of a much more extreme attitude on the part of Dutch architecture today. And I wouldn't say a disengagement from politics, but at least an engagement with quite a different kind of politics. For instance, the success of Atelier von Lishout and a kind of anarchist uh, view of politics. Do you really think that what is happening now in Holland is similar to what was happening with what is, is no, the I'm, I'm generation? Not, I'm not speaking about what happened eight years ago. Um, I'm trying to talk about what's going on. And yes, there is a sense there's a, a, a great new um, a book that was published by the critic Walter von Stipphout uh, last year. Uh, whose title is Too Blessed to be Depressed, which is actually a quote from Missy Elliott, believe it or not. Um, and Wout von Stippau's point is that, in fact, the welfare state in the Netherlands and its extensive subsidy system has led to a kind of anesthetization, anesthetization of both the physical and the political landscape, um, and that the Phoenix locations are the result of this, if you will. It's one of his points. And certainly the, the Vinex locations, for those of you that don't know this strange term, it's, um, it stands for the Fide Nota Extra, but that doesn't matter. What it means is a series of uh, new towns that were built on the edges of uh, Dutch towns, and in some cases even sort of in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's the Dutch latest version of the Dutch New Town movement. Um, there is a, se a sense that many of these Vinex locations, uh, especially the first ones that were built, were disastrous. They were divorced from social services as well as infrastructure. They were monocultures. They were bedroom communities. Um, and they were not very pleasant places. Now, A, you can say that about any um, new town. Uh, the whole problem with new architecture is that it doesn't have any history. No one was killed there. No one was married there. No disasters happened there. No, uh, nothing to accrete memory. And some of these older, the first Vinex locations are now beginning to, to gain some of that, as well as things like supermarkets. But also I think that the new generation of Vinex location projects are becoming more intelligent in their mixture of services. Uh, yes, there's still a lot of problems with them, and the whole notion of these uh, Vinex locations is problematic. On the other hand, I would still say that um, they are by far the best new towns I know of anywhere in Europe and probably the world. Now, there might be other ones out there, but I certainly haven't seen them in everything from scale to, um, to what they have to offer. Um, and I would continue to defend them as such. Um, I don't think that anyone 
whether Case Christiansen or Neutlings or anyone was claiming to make an architecture for all, uh, I think there was always a sense that what one did was to try and manipulate uh, given systems, whether they be technological or legal, to create social housing or to create whatever the building was one had to in a way that would be experimental and at its best critical. Um, sometimes it fails and I think uh, those failures are, are, can be seen all over the place. Um, one other thing I have to say, however, in defense of the Dutch, which uh, when I say this in the Netherlands, they, people look at me, but it, I think it's actually one of the most fundamental differences between the Netherlands and the United States and to a certain extent also with England, although it's changing rapidly in England. And that is, in the Netherlands, when they make a, sh a mistake in architecture, they admit it, tear it down, renovate it, and redo it. The first new towns are already being renovated. The whole heart of Almere is being completely gutted and redone, same with the town of Nieuwegein. There's already plans for redoing some of the first Phoenix locations. There is a sense that the Dutch physical environment is a continual site of experimentation. Um, so I have good hope that uh, they will continue to make those kind of places better. Are the new, is the new generation of architects more radical? Some of them yes, some of them more. I'm not showing you some of the more, if you will, conservative um, architects just because of my own taste. Um, are, they more, um, are they more cynical? I don't think they are. I think there is a great love for what they're doing. I think that the cynicism is no more than that of uh, someone like Rem Kohlhaas or some of the people that came before Rem Kohlhaas. I think it's a very measured cynicism. Um, I wouldn't want to say that it's a Dutch trait, but I do think that it is a way of operating in architecture that is particular to that culture. Ludo, as somebody who's been working on the agricultural territory with your students and as a cynical yeah, Dutchman, one, one thing that I was can, can you take the microphone and just speak to I didn't know we'd, that we'd have all these Dutch people here to oh, he's trip me he's up. French. He's French. Ah, okay. I'm the only Dutch he person. Dutch. No, uh, I think somebody, uh, one, one thing that Holland is being blamed for once in a while, amongst others, I think by Tracy Metz, is a disnification of the yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you understand oh, yeah. that point? Yeah, no, it's absolutely. Um, she, Tracy Metz did a wonderful book that I would recommend to everyone called Fun, Pret in Dutch, uh, which is one of the most intelligent looks at what is a global phenomenon, disnification or the rise of themed environments and places of, um, of uh, entertainment taking over everything. Uh, yes, it's, a, it's that I, I would say um, if, if the Dutch are beginning to figure out how to deal with large office buildings, they now must confront the disnification of, of more and more of their cities and their landscapes. Um, I think that there's a very real danger that um, Amsterdam, like San Francisco or London, uh, within 20 years will be owned by Disney Corporation. You'll just pay when you enter uh, to come into the theme park Amsterdam. Um, that's actually, be it's happening in London already, right? In February. So. Yeah. Um, but. I would just point out that that actually also has historical roots. We're going to do an exhibition next year um, in, uh, at the NEI of uh, the work of the family Koch. And the family Koch were the architects who uh, renovated much of uh, Am the center of Amsterdam starting in the late 19th century and continuing through the early 20th century. And what's remarkable about their archives of photographs is that what they found was a kind of mixture of fragments of older buildings and lots of accreted other stuff. And they basically made it all up. Uh, they decided that 17th century Amsterdam, the golden age, should have looked like a certain image based on some paintings. And they then proceeded to reform Amsterdam to look like the paintings, at least a large part of it. And I think that the uh, the saving grace of the Netherlands, or at least the saving grace of the architects that, that interest me, are like that image of the NL architects of swimming in the canals. They have a profound awareness of the kind of artificiality of that kind of environment and want to make it visible in their work. And that to me is, is one of the things that I think uh, 
our Reality Machines exhibition will be about, and that I think it's, uh, gets me most excited. But, uh, I get the impression, though, from at least the work that you've shown us, that the majority of the projects are really um, focusing on the housing and housing estates and sort of smaller scale developments where the notion of the surreal, for example, as in the case of the person swimming in the canal, are limited to certain confined territories. In other words, they don't seem to be operating at the level of the urban where the juxtaposition of the swimmer in the canal and the city comes, there's something that's gained well, from, that, from that urbanity, but it's really from the kind of, the, you know, it's from the juxtaposition of the elements within a certain confined environment. Well, it's not quite true because they built actually their bridge, which I showed the slide of um, in Leitzerain with its multiple fingers. Uh, and they've built a number of other projects like that. Um, so I think it is implemented. Uh, of course, the most intriguing ones are the ones that never get built. But I think the point that you make about the surreal is important because there is a sense that there is a kind of normalcy about Dutch work that's relentless, um, which is both its strength and its weakness. But the other thing is that it's interesting. When I, when I arrived in the Netherlands and um, I, I, you know, there was a little notice on page six saying, you know, Weird American becomes new director of museum, and that was about it. And then somebody came and did an interview with me and said, "Well, why did you move here?" And I said, "Well, because Dutch architecture is the best in the world, and it's this is where it's happening, and this is fantastic." And instantly, this was like page one news, and I got in, I got 12 interviews in the next week. Everyone starting out with, "What the hell are you saying? Dutch arch? There is no Dutch architecture," and I realized that to the Dutch, like most other people. Uh, architecture is big buildings. They said, well, we have no Louvre here. That's the example they kept. Three different newspapers said, well, we don't have buildings like the Pay Pyramid. Um, so how can you say we have, or the Pompidou, how can you say that we have architecture here? Uh, and my whole point was that the architecture in the Netherlands is part and parcel of the, of the environment and is not the making of erotic gherkins. Okay. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks for Thank being you. Here. See you again.